In this video, I want to show you how a weird yet simple theorem transformed our understanding of physics and the fascinating sequence of arguments related to it that led to the Nobel Prize in 2022. You may have already seen Bell's theorem, but here I will give you a glimpse into how John Bell arrived at his theorem, what his precise assumptions were, and the deep significance this result has had for the foundations of physics. Although 60 years has passed since the publication of Bell's famous result, it remains one of the most misunderstood ideas in physics, with a common opinion held that it rules out hidden variable theories, despite the fact that it makes a rather different claim. My goal will be to bring as much conceptual clarity as possible to some of the most common sources of confusion, so that by the end of the video, you will have a clear understanding of the significance of this result and why, had John Bell lived long enough, he certainly would have been awarded the Nobel Prize. Since the paper in which Bell proves his theorem was a response to the EPR thought experiment introduced by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, in order to gain a full appreciation of Bell's theorem, we must begin with the EPR argument. In 1935, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen published a paper titled, Can Quantum Mechanical Description of Physical Reality Be Considered Complete? where they focused precisely on finding an answer to this question. Though it can be quite hard to understand at times, the entire paper is only four pages long, and I highly encourage you to take a look at it yourself. I've put a link to it in the description section below for anyone who is interested. For the purposes of understanding Bell's theorem, the EPR argument can be succinctly summarized conceptually in just four steps, with the first three consisting of their foundational assumptions, and the final step consisting of the conclusion that follows. So what were their fundamental assumptions? The first assumption is extremely straightforward. The predictions of quantum mechanics are correct. The second assumption is something they call a criterion of reality. This can be a bit difficult to understand based on the wording of the paper, but essentially what it means is that in any situation where you have a physical system, if, without doing anything to the system, you are able to predict with certainty or with a probability of 100% some physical quantity of the system, then there must be something real that is responsible for that physical quantity. If you have any doubts about this criterion, I encourage you to try and imagine a scenario where this wouldn't hold. See if you can come up with a hypothetical scenario where you know some physical or measurable quantity with 100% certainty and there's no corresponding element of reality responsible for it. Okay, let's now consider their final assumption. The third and final assumption they make is that physics is local. This means that experiments carried out on a system in one region of space should not in any way disturb the state of a system that exists in a faraway region in space. This one is a quite natural assumption to make, and we will see that it's incredibly important as it will also play a key role in helping us understand the significance of Bell's theorem. So those are the three foundational assumptions of the EPR argument. The conclusion they arrive at is that these three assumptions entail that quantum mechanics must be incomplete. In other words, what their argument amounts to is that if these three assumptions are correct, then there must necessarily be some element of reality that has no corresponding element in the theory of quantum mechanics. Now, in order to see how this conclusion follows from the assumptions, I think it's incredibly helpful to consider a much simpler case than the one EPR considered in their paper. This simplification was originally produced by the physicist David Bohm. Whereas EPR considered both the position and momentum of a two-particle system, Bohm was able to make the same argument by just considering spin. So in this simpler example, consider a pair of particles that form a system with total spin equal to zero. Each of these particles are spin one half. What it means for a particle to be spin one half is that if you send it through a stern gerlach apparatus oriented in any direction, there are only two possibilities. Either it will be deflected up with a probability of one half, or it will be deflected down with the same probability. The way to describe the system in conventional Brockett notation is as follows, where this is often referred to as the singlet state. The next step in this thought experiment is to consider what would happen if the two particles were separated in such a way that the total spin of the system is not affected. Then imagine two Stern-Gerlach apparatuses, which we'll label as A and B. 
let them be placed a far distance apart where they can be reasonably assumed to have no interaction with each other. They can be placed in any orientation whatsoever, as long as they are in the same direction. Now imagine that one of the particles passes through one of the apparatuses. Let's say particle one passes through apparatus A and comes out up. Since the total spin of this system is zero, what quantum mechanics predicts is that the other particle must necessarily, that is with probability equal to one, come out down. And if particle one were to come out down, then particle two must come out up. Now before the measurement of either particle occurs, we are free to choose any direction in which to orient the stern gerlach apparatuses. No matter which direction they are oriented, as soon as one particle is measured, we immediately know what the spin in the same direction of the other particle must be. So before even measuring the second particle, we can predict with 100% certainty the value of its spin. Therefore, in light of the three assumptions made by EPR, we have here a situation where the prediction of quantum mechanics in this case is correct. Since physics is local and the two apparatuses are very far apart, the measurement on particle one cannot disturb particle two. And we can predict with certainty the spin of particle two without disturbing it. Therefore, there must be some element of reality responsible for this. But the wave function describing the system does not include this element of reality. It only contains a superposition of states and the probability associated to each value. Therefore, since this element of reality does not appear in quantum mechanics, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen argue that the theory must be incomplete. There must be some additional or hidden variables added to the theory to explain why particle two has the spin that it does. And despite the cleverness of this argument, it simply remained at the level of a thought experiment. Until in 1964, John Bell published a paper titled On the einstein podolsky rosen Paradox. In it, he proved a theorem that made it possible to design a real experiment that could actually put EPR's conclusion to the test and produce what some physicists have called the most profound result in the history of physics. But before discussing Bell's theorem, I'd like to quickly mention two more results that played a significant role in Bell's thinking about EPR. The first was a theorem proved by John von Neumann in a textbook titled The Mathematical Foundations of Quantum Mechanics, a monumental work where he provides the first rigorous mathematical framework for quantum mechanics. At one point in the book, von Neumann proves a very technical theorem that essentially says any theory that contains hidden variables must violate one of the axioms of quantum mechanics. Namely, the axiom that physical observables are represented by operators that exist in a Hilbert space. So a hidden variable theory is possible, but it must necessarily have a slightly different structure. And interestingly, although Bell knew about this proof, an English translation of the work was not available until 1955. So Bell initially only knew about it secondhand. And he was told that von Neumann ruled out hidden variable theories altogether a mistaken idea that led to Bell's shock at seeing the second significant result, David Bohm's development of Bohmian mechanics in 1952. Bohmian mechanics is a hidden variable theory that has exactly the type of structure von Neumann's proof did not exclude. It was these two apparently contradictory ideas in combination with the EPR argument that seemed to have led Bell to his monumental achievement in discovering the theorem that bears his name. In fact, von Neumann, Bohm, and Einstein make up five of the seven citations he references in the paper. So what exactly is Bell's theorem? Bell begins his paper by summarizing the EPR argument. A crucial point I'd like to emphasize is that the only thing that Bell explicitly assumes is exactly what EPR assumed. He summarizes their argument as proceeding from locality to hidden variables. He himself does not assume hidden variables. Now there are some subtleties involved in teasing out what else he implicitly assumes, which I'll mention later on, but the key starting point for Bell is locality. So in this context, with locality as the key assumption, and then hidden variables depending on this assumption, Bell captures the idea of hidden variables mathematically by introducing a general parameter, lambda. 
This parameter could be a single variable or multiple variables. It doesn't matter for the proof. So now in the experimental setup, according to this analysis, the result of a spin measurement will not just depend on the orientation of the stern gerlock apparatus, but also on lambda. Since the results of each measurement will simply be up or down, we can choose to represent up with a plus one and down with a minus one. The results at each apparatus could then be represented by the following. Where A is the orientation of the left stern gerlock apparatus, and B is the orientation of the right stern gerlock apparatus. And the locality assumption means that the result for particle 2 does not depend on the direction of A, nor does the result for particle 1 depend on the direction of B. Now let's consider the products of these two outcomes. In the case where each apparatus is oriented in the same direction, we will always get a plus 1 and minus 1. So the product will be minus 1. Now what would happen if each apparatus was oriented in a different direction? Let's say A was in the X direction and B was in the Z direction. Since the directions are perpendicular to each other, quantum mechanics predicts that there is now a 50% chance of plus one or minus one occurring at each measurement. So you could get plus one plus one, plus one minus one, minus one plus one, or minus one minus one and the product can be either plus one or minus one. Here's where Bell's incredible insight comes in. If you consider any arbitrary orientation of the two stern gerlock apparatuses and then run a large number of experiments, the expectation value or average result that quantum mechanics predicts is negative a dot b. Now, if there's a hidden variable, the expectation value will be written in this way where rho is the probability distribution of lambda. Then simply by considering a vector in another direction c and performing a few steps that just require some basic algebra, Bell shows that these two expectation values cannot equal each other and that the following inequality must hold if there is a hidden variable. And the amazing thing is that this inequality cannot be satisfied by the predictions of quantum mechanics. You can see this from a very simple example. Suppose A is in the X direction, B is in the Y direction, and C makes a 45 degree angle with each. Then, according to quantum mechanics, we would have these values. And if we plug them into the inequality, we get a contradiction. What Bell has done here is truly remarkable. He has shown that there's a way to check by experiment, whether this inequality is satisfied or not. All that's needed is to actually perform the experiment where you orient the stern gerlock apparatuses in different directions. Then, based on the expected value or average of the results you get, if there are local hidden variables determining the results, then the inequality should be satisfied. If the experimental results do not satisfy the inequality and instead agree with the predictions of quantum mechanics, then we can conclude that the key assumption that went into all of this, that physics is local, is wrong. The measurement of one particle really does affect the distant particle, no matter how far away it is. And in 1972, a physicist named John Clauser was able to successfully carry out the first experimental test of this inequality. He found that the inequalities were indeed violated. So the physics of our universe is non-local. Spooky action at a distance truly occurs in nature, as Einstein so famously rejected. Unless there's something wrong with Bell's implicit assumptions. That's right. There are a few ways out of this conclusion if you choose to reject one of the implicit assumptions that went into Bell's argument. Though this path seems to lead to a universe that is even weirder than what non-locality entails. I'll mention just two of the most interesting ones, many worlds and super determinism. An assumption that you might not have realized was made in this analysis was what actually happens when a measurement is taken. Remember, according to quantum mechanics, before the spin measurement is taken at the first detector, each particle is in a superposition of spin up 
and spin down. And when we make a measurement, we find a result that is only one of those states, either up or down. But there was also a 50% chance that the other state could have been the result. What the many worlds interpretation says is that both of the possibilities occurred just in different branches of the universe. So by rejecting the assumption that only one of these results occurs, Bell's argument doesn't apply and consequently, locality can still be upheld. Although this might seem like an extremely strange idea, there are prominent physicists that have advocated for this view, including people like Sean Carroll, David Deutsch, and Stephen Hawking. What about superdeterminism? This one is incredibly subtle. What superdeterminism denies is an implicit assumption that was made about the hidden variable parameter lambda. Namely, that we could define the probability distribution of lambda independently of the detector settings. This idea sometimes goes by the name of statistical independence. From the perspective of superdeterminism, there is some deeper level of determinism that must be at play that prevents this type of statistical independence from occurring. And since statistical independence is present in the derivation of Bell's inequality, by rejecting it, it is possible to recover locality. There are also prominent physicists that have advocated for this view as well, including Gerard Tehuft, Sabine Hossenfelder, and Timothy Palmer. So it turns out there are some subtle ways out of the conclusion Bell reached. But nevertheless, we know that Bell's inequality is violated. So if Bell's assumptions are correct, nature is indeed non-local. And after the experiment done by Clauser, there have been subsequently many more experiments done that all verify this result. Two of the most significant were those done by Alain Aspe and those done by Anton Zeilinger, where they closed important loopholes that were involved in earlier experiments. And in 2022, Clauser, Aspe, and Zeilinger were all jointly awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics, a prize that certainly would have been shared with John Bell for his monumental theoretical achievement had he still been alive.